I'm sure he might have an excuse on why he can't. Heart surgery is not really an excuse, but no. <laughs> Yes. Sound the alarm in our hearts, Lord. Sound the alarm in your body. Across the earth, let it ring out to the four corners of the earth. Let your army arise, Spirit of God, to stand for what you get and what you want. The fullness of what you want in your body. And may it, Lord, be a time of confrontation with the powers of darkness at every level. That you are not succumbing and you are not submitting to the darkness and to the evil. And that you have a people that it's driven out of fully and they won't submit to it either. We open our hearts, Lord, our gates to the King of glory. And we're asking you to close them to the prince of the power of the air. To the prince of darkness. To the rebellious spirit. We're asking that that sword of the Lord that divides soul and spirit to come within again, go deeper, plunge it within us deep. We're asking for the right spirit of division, not the wrong spirit of division based on personalities and demonic doctrines and all that nonsense. <laughs> We're asking for the right spirit of division, the division of soul and spirit, the division between the truth, Christ, and what he says, and the lie. And We're asking for the church to be the pillar of the truth in the earth as it's meant to be by life. Sound that alarm, Spirit of God. Cause, Lord, the sinews and the ligaments and the bones and the muscles to, be, uh, to come together and to form a body. That which was dead, Lord, your testimony, your body, may it live again by your life. Yes. 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 Amen. We will. Amen. I think that's a great place to end. We will follow you, Lord, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, by your grace, your mercy, your love, and your spankings, we will follow you. <laughs> Not right, Joel? Uh, you've received a lot of spankings. I've, uh, well, I'm a young man, but maybe I'm just more rebellious. I'm already getting a lot of spankings. Follow you to the end, Lord.
Even if we perish before you see, before we see what you get, it's worth it. It's worth it. Seal our hearts again afresh this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm gonna get Dad up here. Those who are gonna take the offering, you guys can go ahead and come. Good morning. <clears throat> I uh, thought we would begin um, <clears throat> in this this manner. Um, Joel shared a couple of things with me that I wanted us to uh, pray concerning words of knowledge of healing. I find it. Uh, so I wanted to pray for this and then some other things. So uh, little children uh, who've been having um, ear infections or ear issues, um, parents, you would know. Uh, so we want to pray for the little children. So if they're here, you can stand up with them. And then for um, the elderly people, he said, He was looking at me when he said it. <laughs> no, I'm flat. One elderly guy looking to the other. <laughs> right? Now, for ear problems for the elderly, those who have ear issues. And then, uh, he didn't say this, but I am for husbands and wife who have ear issues with one another. <laughs> no, 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 forget that one. <laughs> we don't need healing for that. <laughs> No, uh, I uh, want to also pray for uh, those experiencing um, function and movement issues with your fingers and your toes. So if that's uh, something you need prayer for or the children, I want you to stand up and we're going to pray. Ask the Lord to heal. <clears throat> the Lord's the healer whether you're having those problems or not, of course. If you need just need healing without those problems, you can stand. But specifically, these things coming from by word of knowledge. Now, Lord, you are the healer. We're asking for your healing upon these little ones with ear infections, <clears throat> some of them ongoing, some type of uh, bacteria or virus gotten into the ears and into the canal. We're asking you to hear to heal so that they can hear and to protect them, Lord. For those who of us who are older, experiencing ear damage or loss of hearing, we're asking you to heal, Lord Jesus. And then, Lord, for function and movement in the fingers and the toes, Be again the healer that we know you are. And throughout this body and those listening and will be listening, be the healer to your people, Lord. You are the healer. You are the healer. Be that today to your people. We ask, heal, restore function, bring divine health, and wholeness to your people, we ask in the name of Jesus. Break the power and the schemes and plans of the enemy against your people. Heal and restore, Lord, we ask. Amen. <clears throat> One other thing I'm going to do uh, before I get into the message, um, I'm kind of entitling this. I'm not kind of. I am. I'm entitling entitling this um, little talk <laughs> sharing. It's <laughs> yeah. I'm entitled to it. No, I'm entitling it. Um, 
a short term, but a look down the road for our nation. A look down the road for our nation. It's of importance or I wouldn't be sharing it as far as I'm concerned. You may not feel the same way, that whatever, but I feel it is important, so I'm going to, uh, to share it. <clears throat> I believe um, it'll make sense um, in the next few months because I think we're looking at not years in this short-term look. I'm thinking we're looking at some months, so there's importance I believe in uh, the warning that I got from the Lord. Uh, so there's a, a uh, part of this that was literally like a interstate in front of me. Donna and I were traveling in a, some type of vehicle down this interstate and uh, we had to uh, come to a halt and then move very slowly forward because of these multi and large potholes that were in the road in front of us. Um, let me say to you, what I'm about to describe is dealing with economics and governmental issues, and then the governmental issues would include resources, source resources, finances, support, those types of things from states down right down to individuals. So uh, the road was filled with potholes for a, some hundreds of yards. It was not lengthy, so what I'm describing is a short difficult time in our nation. It's not the big one that has been foretold by the Lord, but it is short term, but not far in front of us. Does that make sense? So the roadway was filled with potholes due to the lack of them being addressed over the years. Potholes representing different things some of different depths. I knew this, to go speeding through that area would be to uh, blow out your tires and break your axles on the vehicle if you went fast. What was already slowed down was, became much slower of necessity. That's an economic term. Again, this is not... Uh, a, the big one. It may feel that way when you're in the midst of things like this, but it won't be. Um, that has not been prayed away yet. And this that I'm talking about now is coming. There is no stopping it. So, um, there was because of the potholes, they were representing uh, many things, including uh, <clears throat> agendas, mismanagement, overspending, and the national debt out of control. But all triggered by governmental overreach and irresponsible and unlawful actions in various leaders. Lies, oppression, criminal, criminal actions <clears throat> will be a portion of uh, why this stretch of the road is filled with potholes and the difficulties of the time. Uh, as I said before, slow down is a must. And uh, that will be in various, various types of applications. Navigating will be treacherous, but not impossible. Especially, I'll say this to God's people, to trust him to be led and directed by him. Uh, so they'll be treacherous, but not impossible. Um, not impossible for the righteous and the wise. Let's say it that way. 
So there was some statements that was said to me, and I'll come back to some more of this. As I was looking at this, these statements were made to me by the Lord. He spoke, he said, uh, fractured functions. The breaking of structure in the nation like bones of support being broken. Secondly, functional disabilities. The restriction of an own movement within the nation as well as progress. Instead, limitations. Lastly, um, disabling of functions particularly uh, important functions as well as unnecessary functions. In fact, unnecessary functions, unimportant functions were leading to the disabling of important functions um, because they have robbed and drained the resources. There'll be no bailout this time. So there'll be a disabling of government functions, not all, but some, um, as well as disabling of certain businesses, disabling of supply and demand for short periods of time, some areas of the nation worse than others. So the demand of supplies will not be able to be met, part of that being to the lack of movement at times going on in the nation. Again, this will be short term and uh, it will then be better. But I say again, um, it's not the end, nor is it the big one that the Lord has talked and spoken about for years and foretold. <clears throat> Worse will follow what we're about to experience. And it will be what I saw in this was national. The worst is international. But it's at a distance. The mercy of God is in this so that we can trust him again as we must always. And he is trustworthy. He will prove that to us. That does not mean, of course, that we will uh, have it easy. It does not mean that everything will be great and taken care of. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Lord is saying, but we can trust him. Right? <clears throat> and uh, we'll be a great another since 2000 and what, eight and nine since that time um, when that was a hard hit upon the nation. That wasn't the big one either. Uh, but he will be trustworthy. The, you know, said this way, the fear of the Lord is going to need to be great in us and become greater in us. So let me finish up this part um, with reading a little bit more practical warnings and admonitions. More shortages in the supply and demand chain will occur due to interstate disruptions. Secondly, federal support will be small and at times non-existent, including the breakdown temporarily of monthly type checks. Thirdly, some states will be forced to provide for what the federal government cannot. Others will be unable because of their own economic issues. To have the Lord's wisdom in this time forth is paramount. <clears throat> I would advise strongly, if possible, for you who do not have, um, let's say it this way, if you're depending upon the supermarket, I would advise strongly that you uh, store up at least a few weeks worth of food. That's dialing it way back for me. I've had people say to me things like, well, Terry, you know, I, I just trust in God. 
No, you're trusting in the system we have, and uh, it's not trustworthy. And I don't need to store because I trust God. If you go back 100 years in this nation, that would be foolish talk. There were no supermarkets. We have built a trust in our system, and I'm telling you, it's going to be shaken. We're not trusting God. We're trusting we can go to the supermarket. And I'm just uncovering it in front of us, that lack of trust that that actually shows. We're going to need to trust the Lord. Depending on where you live, things can be way worse than others, of course. If you're able to grow gardens, if you're able and have been able, if you have your own meat, those types of things, this will not be as big a problem for some as it will be for others. But I still advise you to store food and to read the Proverbs chapter 6 where even the ant knows enough to store. Right? Hello? For over most of the 6,000 years that man's been on this earth, except for the last less than 100 years, he had to store. We need to wake up. Our trust is in a system that's no longer trustworthy. Amen. Well, that's it. So that's it for now. There's another one coming called the coming deluge, but not for now. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Is this about the coming deluge? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right. So I hope you didn't get too frightened. The worst thing that can happen in this is that we get paralyzed by fear. It's, you know, Daniel says it well, doesn't he? He writes it well. Those who know their God will take action. <laughs> That's the opposite of being paralyzed by fear. <clears throat> What's the worst that can happen to us? We die and go be with Jesus? That's not bad, <laughs> right? No, that's not going to be the case, especially in this short-term thing. So, all right. So, let's look at uh, this morning at a couple of passages of Scripture. I'm continuing thematically in this um, God recovering the apostolic ministry. And this message is a part of that. So, I'm focused upon the headship of Christ. As I said, the one new man has a head. Christ is it expresses his headship through chosen a chosen vessel, right? So I'm going to continue thematically down that path so that we understand God's restoration, understand what he is doing, why he is doing it, so that the government of God can come right down to every believer from within. So leadership is that way, right? Leadership is there for God to get his rights, get what he wants, have his eternal way. Leadership there is there to express his will only, not their own, his will only. Leadership is not there to express their carnal minds. Leadership is not there to express the natural mind. Leadership is not there to get their selfish ways. Leadership is not there to tell everybody what they need to be doing about everything in their life. Leadership is there concerning the body that is Christ's. It is a stewardship, leadership is. And let me say it this way, the wisdom of God is operating in it unto God, how God builds his body, not how God blesses it. You understand the difference? I'll say it one more time. I want the Lord to help us Catch what I'm trying to convey. Leadership is there. The headship of Christ manifesting through them is so that we understand from the Lord how he builds his body. We're talking about spiritually, inwardly, as well as corporately. But first, spiritually, inwardly. Build rather than bless. Amen? Amen? At some point in this path to readiness, hear me clearly. 
We're going to move beyond blessing. And being builded is going to take the priority. Builded together to become a dwelling place of God in the spirit, right? That's God's will. He's made that clear. That's not new. But uh, the, right now in Western culture Christianity, a lot of blessing ministries. And thus we're in the condition we're in. God is raising up by his own choosing, by his own work, that that builds. The wise master builder ministry, Christ being the master builder. What does that mean? It means this. God has a plan already. We have deviated from it. Have you ever thought to ask the Lord, what is your plan? You ever thought to ask him that? Because it's already established and it can't be changed. And he's not interested in my or your two cents worth. Did I say that rightly? Let me say it again. (laughs) There is a master builder. The plan's already there. The way, the truth, the life, already there. Everything dead set in God. And our carnal minds, Christians has killed what God wanted. And we still think God wants it. And it's blessing, not building. And we need to wake up and repent for our own carnal mindedness in these matters. Leaders, but right down to every single one of us, putting our hands on that, which is already the master builder set in what he would do. And he knows how to do it. And it's by his spirit entirely. And we can have a part in it by submitting. We cannot have a part in it by directing him. That is an abomination to God. And it is a loss of the fear of God that causes it. Wouldn't you agree? We are in the predicament we're in because of the loss of the fear of the Lord. We think our minds and our thoughts and our ways are okay with God. They are not. And he does not build that way at all. How he builds is already established. Hear me, eternally. It cannot be altered without great harm. And it has been altered by man in this world to great harm. My question to us is, do we want that which doesn't presently exist? Or are we going to continue doing the same thing we've been doing? The same way, same thoughts, same processes. Fighting for our own stuff, or do we want the Lord to finally get what he wants? That's my question to all of us. Let me say it plainly. Your ways and my ways are non-existent to God. He will not honor them. He has no desire to honor it. It's his way or the highway for us. And I already told you about the potholes in the highway, so that's not too good. (laughs) This is intense, but I've got, got, there's an exorcism needs to go on out of me, out of you, called self. And we can't see it. We're blinded by it. We argue about it. We get puffed up and mad and prideful and arrogant about all of it. I'm just telling you, God loves you, but he doesn't love your thoughts no more than he does mine. He wants us to have his mind, Christ's, not ours. Amen. When I speak about government coming, guys, that means everything else is about to be crushed. And will you accept that and receive it and believe it? If God gets his way in this thing, he will crush everything else and establish his son as the sole head in his body. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm trying to convey to us. This is not, and it must not be the same church we used to be. This cannot be the gathering that it was last week. Does that make sense to us? Or else, guys, we're hearing the word of the Lord. Oh, yes, that's great. And then we go on about our lives. 
God, wake us up. Don't you think, Enoch? Wake us up. A governmental change is major, needed and major. Amen. Well, so the Lord has this nasty habit or a wonderful habit. It depends on how you view it, all right? If you're after what you want, it's a nasty habit. But if we're after what the Lord wants, it's a beautiful and it's a master builder issue. The wise master builder ministry exists so that the master builder can have his way. That's the only reason it exists. Its necessity is Christ as head getting what he wants in his body. Right? So <clears throat> when I look at uh, Malachi, and we're going to look at Malachi, um, I'm going to look then at some characteristics of the government of God that you should see prominently in leadership. Now, just I did not know what I was going to talk about this morning, but I love it when God confirms, don't you? He didn't know I was going to talk about the fear of the Lord, which I am, <laughs> right out of Malachi, okay? So um, Malachi chapter 2, 3, and 4, um, recognizing that uh, to understand Malachi 3 and 4, you have to understand Malachi 2. You have to. The interpretation of Malachi 3 and 4 is in Malachi 2. So we're going to read Malachi chapter 2, okay? A little bit, you know, this will come out in the background of this when you read it, but the background is the Levites, the priesthood, which come out of the Levites, um, are staying in their sin being disobedient to God and won't come out to him. That's a little bit of the background. The priesthood, the leaders, let me be clear, the leaders of God's people are in a sad state of affairs. They are in sin. And they won't let uh, that situation be remedied by the Lord. Sound familiar? And if you've got that condition, if you have that condition in leadership, you're going to have that condition in the people to some degree. Right? So let's read. Therefore this, verse 1 of chapter 2, therefore this decree is for you priests. If you don't listen, I've got to stop there, Gary. That's everything I just said up to this point. Are we listening? Right? God's people. Not just here at the gathering. Yes, here at the gathering. Am I listening to the Lord? Are you listening? I mean really listening. Are we fitting in what God's saying into our little box so we can continue living the way we've been living, thinking the way we've been thinking, having concepts the way we've been having concepts, acting the way we've been acting? Or can God shake us out of our lethargic attitudes, out of our soulish mindsets? He can. He's capable, isn't he? It's whether we're willing. I say to us again, this cannot be the church you knew. It cannot. It must not. We will completely miss the Lord if any of us remain where we have been. Not just me. Not just Josiah. All of us. Are we listening? Listen to what he says. If you don't listen and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies. Recently, the Lord appeared to me again. The Omega man did, identifying himself. The Omega man's an eternal designation of himself, but identified himself in the last days. The Omega man will be the Lord of armies, Lord of the Sabbath, 
the great mighty warrior unleashed one final time to begin a war to end all wars. He said. You believe that? You can read it in the book of Revelation. Might as well believe it. <laughs> Don't you think, Francie? He's going to end all wars by making war. Peace is on the other side of him making war. Only. Right? I will send a curse among you and I will curse your blessings. Now God curses blessing because blessing, when we're stuck in blessing mode, we can't move to building mode. So God curses our blessing so we can be, if willing, builded. God's not against blessing if we don't get a hold of it and make it the whole ball of wax. Right? God's wonderful at blessing his people, loves to bless his people. I love the blessings of God. Healing is a blessing of God. But if we, and we have, if we make everything about blessing, we will never be filled and builded together. We will just be a blessed, immature vessel, which is pretty much what we have going on, don't you think, Ben? America, the blessed, immature vessel. Tell me that's not true, the Church of America. Is that true, Joel? By and large, America is the blessed, immature vessel. Not builded by the life of Christ within, living stone upon living stone, blessed. And we think we're better because we're blessed. I say we're more immature because we're so blessed. Right? All you got to do is go outside this nation. I have multiple times. Others of us have. Go outside this nation and see how unblessed other nations are and how some of the people who are God's people in that nation are so on fire for Jesus. <laughs> Without all the jot and, I'm sorry, all the stuff we have, right? Are y'all awake out there? It is a wonderful message. <laughs> We can keep our stuff and remain immature if our stuff's making us immature. Stuff doesn't have to make you immature. It's kind of neutral, right? But if it is, then God, as he's saying here, will curse our blessing. I will curse your blessing. In fact, I already have begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. See, God's looking at the heart. We're looking at blessing. Things are great because look how blessed we are. But your heart's a wreck and God knows it. See, that's where he's coming from to these people. Look, I'm going to rebuke your descendants and I will spread animal waste I don't know what the Hebrew is for that. I'm not sure I do want to know. <laughs> Come on, guys. This is an intense message. Laugh a little bit. <laughs> Laugh about it. I'll spread uh, animal waste over your faces. That's a new type of makeup he's introducing. <laughs> Couldn't you see it? It's called stink. Get it at your local at your local distributors. Stink. Go in and ask for our new bottle of stink. Well, this is too intense a message not to have humor. So I'm going to throw some humor out there. It's not good humor, but at least it's something. <laughs> Whatever it is. Actually, I think it's funny myself. I'm God saying this kind of stuff. It, when it reaches this place to where the Lord has to say this kind of stuff, Ben, something's been dreadfully wrong for quite some time. This isn't a reaction by God. This is a condition of people. And the condition has brought God forth to move on their behalf in love, in love now, mind you, great love, to get them out of the waste they're living in. So putting it on their faces is no big deal. They've been living in it and living as it. 
What do you think about that, Mel? Isn't that good? <laughs> That'll sell. <laughs> the waste from your festival sacrifices. Look at what he's calling waste, Ben. What they've been doing religiously. God's calling it, he's referring to it as waste. And you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I have sent you this decree so that my covenant with Levi may continue. Notice, he's after a leadership. Do you see that? He's after those who lead, who he chose to lead, who he chose, according to Numbers chapter three, the tribe of Levi is mine. I have taken them because of sparing the firstborn. So they shall be mine. You'll hear that in Malachi 3 in a moment. Numbers 3 come into Malachi 3. Malachi 3, God says the Levites are his. He spared the firstborn in Egypt from dying, the, the, the uh, Israeli children. He spared them, therefore he takes Levi. He takes them to be the firstborn. They are first in divine appointment. Leadership unto God. Representing the, as we know, the firstborn of all of the new creation, Christ himself. Representing the headship. This is in shadow, but it's going to come to reality. It should now be reality in the church, but it's been lost. And I believe leadership is at the very heart of the church's problems. Don't you? The lack of God leadership is the heart of the problem as well as the headship problem. So anyway, let's go on. Um, so that, he says, my covenant with Levi may continue. Thus the Lord says the Lord of armies. He's identifying himself as the Lord of armies because it's a fight. Is it not a fight now, my friends? Are we not in a fight for the government of God? And is it not being resisted? And I can tell you what's resisting it right here in this, our own body, our own carnal natural minds. We think we still need things that God says, I'm trying to wean you off that baby stuff, but you won't be weaned. I'm trying to get you out of that mindset, but I can't. You're fighting for something that's not worth fighting for. Now the Lord of armies is fighting for the right thing. Am I? Are you? What are you fighting for? What am I fighting for? It is important to be in God's battle on his side and in the right battle. Do we even know what he wants? Has he revealed it to us? Has the master builder revealed the master plan in Christ? Can you hear what I'm saying? Now I can say it a lot softer. But I'm not going to. No, no. <laughs> it's hard when you're in the midst of battle. If you ever uh, been in the midst of large crowds, lots of noise, explosions, and things like that going on, uh, most of the time if you whisper, nobody hears it, including your own self. When you're in the midst of battle, it's more like shout to be heard. And we're in the midst of battle. This, we're in the midst of a governmental battle right here in the, the gathering. Can y'all understand that? God's wanting to wrestle with us and establish his own headship so that that headship can be established in each and all of us. Right? Right? Let's be real honest with ourselves. Don't raise your hand on this one. <laughs> Joel, raising your hand right there, brother, lets my carnal sense of humor go all kinds of places that aren't healthy. <laughs> but I wouldn't do that to you. I love you too much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it just comes from that old stuff. <laughs> No, it is worth raising our hands. It's uh, 
We know we want our own, our own ways. We know we want our old ways. We know we've not been sufficiently, hear me, we've not been sufficiently delivered to be able to very well hear what the master builder has to say. And if we stay in that stubborn place, we won't hear it. He'll pass us by. And we, according to this, we'll be under a curse. There's consequences to disobedience. Hello? So here's what he has to say. The Lord of armies is contending for the right government over his people. You think he's not doing that right now? He is. He's identified that very clearly. He's spoken it very clearly. He's appeared unto that purpose. He's talked directly about it. And not only the fact of it, but he's also revealed and is revealing the master builder plan in Christ in a way that I personally can state I've never witnessed, even, even having witnessed it for the past 30 years. God is talking. I choose to listen. I choose not to fulfill this because you've not, have, because you've not listened. I choose to listen. Right? My covenant with, what was the covenant with Levi? My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave those to him and I called for reverence or fear. And he revered me. I want you to catch this meaning here in this. Um, this is the father the fathers revering, fearing, honoring the Lord. Now we can understand Malachi 4 and the work promise there, turning the hearts back to the fathers. That's what this is referencing. This is the right interpretation of that and the principle that God's working from of his own nature. I gave these to him, I called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. You know, it goes hand in hand with what Isaiah talks about, those who uh, tremble at his word. There's an awe, there's a honoring, there's a respect, there's a, let's put it in, uh, the greatest commandment is love, then let's put fear of the Lord right in there in that category of love. To love God is to fear God in the right way. Reverential honoring and respect of God relationally, personally and relationally. Wouldn't you agree? The fear of God is to love him and to love him, hear me, more than we love ourselves to want him more than we want what we want. Amen? There's fear of the Lord is not an impassing emotion. The fear of the Lord is not condemnation. The fear of the Lord is not run and hide from him, shrink back from him. The proper fear of the Lord is to truly love him more than we love ourselves, much more. Love him more than we love each other, which is out of order if it's uh, loving each other more than him. That's out of divine order, and it's not the love of God. Did you know that? That's not displaying the love of God. It's displaying human love. We're talking about the love of God that first and foremost has us loving him. He comes in so that we might love him as he loves us, right? The same love that the Father has for the Son to be in us, John 17. And he establishes that. And then we can be healthy enough to be around each other. <laughs> I 
without wanting to manipulate and use each other. Right? Amen? I heard a couple of amens there. <laughs> so the love of God is the key to the fear of the Lord. To love him supremely and not love ourselves is a true meaning or definition of the fear of the Lord. Let's go on. So there was a time when the father feared the Lord, loved the Lord. Talking about here in uh, Malachi chapter 2. But here in Malachi, the, what's being addressed, those who are being addressed are the children down the line from Levi. And they don't fear the Lord any longer, Joel, nor do they love the Lord then. True instructions, it says, was in the Father's, right? True instruction was in his mouth. and Nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace as a part of the covenant God made with him. Life and peace. Peace with God because they're at peace with God. They're not resisting. They're not fighting. They don't want their own way, right? He walked with me in peace. He walked with me in integrity. He turned away from iniquity. Isn't that right? Right out of the Proverbs. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Does that know what it says? If we're loving evil and claiming to love God, that makes us a liar. Isn't that true? <clears throat> For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. And the people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. Did y'all catch that? When God restores leadership, he's restoring his own voice. When God restores leadership, he's restoring his own word. When God restores leadership, he's restoring his own plan. When God restores leadership, he's restoring his desire. He's calling us to what he eternally has wanted. That's why they're called the messengers of the Lord. The Levites were. They taught the people. They were shepherded by God through that instruction of the Lord, though. Do you understand what I'm getting at? It was instruction of the Lord, Scott. Not instruction about things that mattered, Enoch. They were to exemplify and thus also teach, instruct concerning the Lord, who he is and what he wants, and of the giving of themselves completely to him. That's true instruction, isn't it? This was not some just random thing. So we're going to talk about this because we need to talk about this and, you know, I like it and it's good and it's... We're talking about knowing the Lord. We're talking about the, revel the revealing of God, the revelation for us of Christ. We're talking about what is of primary importance. We're talking about that which builds, not blesses, we're talking about that that is within the inner man worked by the Holy Spirit in this right being to where the Holy Spirit is establishing the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's my fight. Is it your fight? Is that what you're after? Is that what we want? What do we want, people? Gathering, what do we want? I plead with us to get some deliverance and get over here where the Lord is, especially in our minds, especially in our hearts. We have fought in times past for the wrong things. Let it be no more. It is a plea I'm issuing from the Lord. We cannot have our way and him ever get his. The insanity of it all must cease and stop and desist and let the Lord arise and establish himself finally in a people. And thus he restores leadership for that purpose, for his people. They're the sheep of his pasture. We are stewards of God. 
and a house that does not belong to us. Amen? Let's go on. It gets better. <laughs> Listen to that. For the lips of the priest, they were appointed by God to teach. The Levites were there to teach. God appointed them to it. You just don't laissez-faire into teaching. You're either appointed or you're not. I don't care what you think about it. Read the scriptures. Not all are teachers. And I'm just not talking about being able to teach in the natural. I'm talking about being appointed by God to do so. Chosen by God to do so. The Levites were chosen. So were the 12. Can you understand what's going on then? We've had 2,000 years of this nonsense to where what has arisen in the church has been carnal, has been natural-minded, has been those unchosen by God leading, and has led us into this condition. Now, whether we want out or not is our decision. What do we want? In the time we're living in, things need to be prioritized by God, and he does. And what is of greatest importance is first in all matters. Can you hear what I'm trying to convey to us? Can you hear what the Lord would say to us? The master builder has something to say. Jesus has something to say to us. He would reprioritize us from within to the importance as to what he views important. There is something above everything else and Christ is the one. And the people are to be fed Christ. 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 If we're going to be healthy, it's from a diet of eating of him, drinking of him. Because he said, if you don't eat and drink of me, you won't have life. That means you won't ever be healthy without eating and drinking of me. Not occasionally, all the time. Not when we feel like it. That's an emotion. Right? When did I feel ever become our guidance? In the fall, that's when. Is this too tough a message for us? Even sheep get sheared from now on. <laughs> it really gets down to this for me. This really isn't that tough a message. These things are just true. It's just that we're not used, perhaps, maybe you hear, hopefully you are, but maybe we're not here, used to hearing it. But we should be. Right? I'm saying we should be used to hearing what God wants and that nothing else matters to him. Right? And if a leader's not fighting for what God wants, they have no business leading. I don't care even if they're called. It doesn't matter. You can be a called leader, but leading by your own mind, your own will, to your own desires, and uh, you're of no use to God. And you're going to be judged, as is the warning, teachers will be judged more strictly. Do we understand that? Teachers will be judged more strictly. It, it matters what's being taught. It matters who's being taught. It matters whether God appoints and chooses or not. It matters. It matters. It matters whether we've uh, majored on minors. We are. Or the one is the one. Right? Well, let's go on. <clears throat> so, I read, read this one more time. For the lips of a priest should guard. What's that mean? Guard knowledge. The door's not open to anything goes. To anyone and everyone. 
the door's not open. God didn't open it, and they knew it. And if they did what God didn't do, God judged them. A curse came upon them. Right? A little bit of leaven works through the whole lump. Just a little bit. It's all it takes. There's those things, my friends, that puff us up. Getting what we want. Puff us up with knowledge. And then there's those things, Romans 8, that build the body. Love builds the body. Love for God. Do you understand what he's saying there? To love God. The God who loves you, to love him back as he loves you, builds the body. You know what's being said here? The fear of the Lord. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble. Tell me that's not true, Ben. And leadership in the church today, all it takes is to give in to yourself, to your flesh, or give in to the flesh. Give in to the will, self-will. Yourself or others. That's all it takes. I can elaborate on that, but uh, <laughs> we know it all too well. I hope we do. I hope we can see it clearly. And the consequences and results that we've come to because of it. So easily offended because we don't get our way. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. See why they're guarding knowledge? Why are they guarding what's being taught? You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. God's in a fight with them. Now, I don't want that to be true of us. How about you? You think it can be? You think it has been? Just let's get real personal. You think the Lord of Armies has ever fought against you? The answer to that is if we've ever fought against the Lord of Armies. That's the real answer, isn't it? If we've resisted the Lord instead of the devil, guess who was resisting us? <laughs> If we have resisted the Lord instead of resisting the devil, guess who's resisting us? <laughs> Isn't that true, Madeline? This is, this is, guys, don't feel condemned. He's talking about me. You're right, I am, <laughs> along with myself. I'm talking about everybody in the room. I'm not singling you out. God may be, but I'm not. And if God's singling you out, I'm sorry. Well, maybe I'm not. That's a sign of love. He scourges every son he brings near. <laughs> so are we afraid of God or something, of being scourged? Anybody been scourged lately? Because if you have, that means he's making you to be a son or a daughter. It comes by scourging, not by blessing. It comes by scourging, not by letting us get our way. <laughs> this is a real role, isn't it? <laughs> It's like that uh, over there at Yellowtail. It's my favorite. Spicy spider roll. Have you had that, Andy? Oh, brother. It has. This is a commercial for Yellowtail. <laughs> what do you think, Ken? It has crab meat shredded, stacked that high on that roll. You ask Nathaniel. Nathaniel's seen me eat it. <laughs> he told me, he said, that's the biggest roll I've ever seen. Well, I don't know if we're on that kind of a big roll, but we're on a roll right now. <laughs> a real spicy roll we're on here. All right, so let's go on. So, um, I, I, you know, guys, let God show us how we resist him. Let God show us how we're fighting. It usually gets down to this. We're fighting for our own way. Right? 
There's no right way as long as it's ours. There's only a right way if it's God's. Fight the good fight, the right fight. Fight for what God wants, especially with your own soul. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Then we can see clearly the steps that are ordained by the Lord, but we won't see them as long as we're in the wrong fight. We'll be blinded to it. So, you have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies, so I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in your instruction. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do you act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? See, that's chapter two explaining chapter four, the turning of the hearts back to the fathers to when they revered God, thus when they feared God and when they loved God. I say to us again, it's impossible to be absent the fear of the Lord and claim to love God. It's impossible to not revere and honor and respect him above ourselves and claim to really love him. We love self more. That's the truth of it. Y'all ready to move on? Finally. Okay. Well, I don't know how much you're going to like the rest of it. <laughs> but it's giving meaning to what follows. So what does God do? Right? What does God do with the condition being that the leadership is out of divine order? The condition being that the leadership is basically in sin. There's no basically to it. That's the fact. The leadership is in sin against God. They are a rebellion against the covenant that God has given them. Chapter three, I'll skip over. See, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant you delight in, see, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. The Lord of armies again. Catch that, Heidi? That's really interesting, isn't it? There's a war, a final one. He aims to win it and end all war. Aren't you looking forward to that? But first, he's got to finish this war in me. He's got to win the war in me and you, among his people. He's got to win. We got to let him. We got to be willing to let God win. Isn't that true? The Lord of armies is speaking. Take note of that. Over and over again, it's the Lord of armies addressing. There's a fight going on, or he wouldn't be addressing himself as the Lord of armies. He's in a war, and he's in a war in his own house. Can you hear that from him? He is in a war in his own house and he's in a war in his own house with the leadership and with the people. When leadership is serving the people rather than God, God is making war on the leadership. You want me to say that again? When leadership is serving the people rather than God, God is making war on the leadership. It is not unto people first. It is unto God. And then God threw to people. Right? It is not what people want that matters. It's what God's after eternally that matters. What people want is fickle as one person to the next is in numbers. If we have however many people we got here today, we could have if selfish people... And there's nobody selfish out there. I'm just saying, but what if you guys were selfish and so was I? Then whatever number of people we have in this room would be the number of selfish things at least one time over that we want. And how does God meet those needs? He doesn't, nor does he desire to other than by giving the one. And he draws us into oneness with himself by giving us the one. And he unifies us only that way. If we unify, I warn us, if we unify this way, we will be in rebellion against God. 
if we unify here, right? And then the cross works and establishes him as supreme and superior. Then we can have fellowship with him and then with one another. There must be no fellowship just this way and calling that church when the fellowship is with him, then one another. I'm just quoting the scriptures, right? But the principles of God in these scriptures are key to what God is doing, not only in our midst, but across the nations, wherein he is allowed to. Right? All right, let's go on. <clears throat> so, I've read this before, so I won't be... Uh, go over it all again and beat the dead horse to death. <laughs> but who can endure the day of his coming? Because he's not coming as a flower child casting daisies. <laughs> That's a kick back to the 60s, right? <laughs> For those of us who remember the 60s. He's not coming as a peacemaker with people. He's a peacemaker with God alone. He's the prince of peace unto God. There can be no peace in this world until peace is made with God. That's the truth. So he's not coming as a flower child. The world's gonna be saying, this is Thessalonians, peace, peace when sudden destruction comes upon them. That's a worldwide statement being made there in Thessalonians. Right? Man's offering peace, isn't that right, Joel? His form of it, that's what's coming, a peace movement by an antichrist, including in religions. Let's all be at peace. It's just love. We're already hearing it. Right? That's what the Pope was saying. Right? Right? Papa Pope. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's so disrespectful. To who? <laughs> to God, you're right. Well, that's where the disrespect is. Wrong father. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he comes as a refiner's fire and the launderer's bleach. The way this one says it, bleach. Kind of one of those things, Joe, I'll make you white one way or the other. I'll just pour this bleach right down over top of your head. <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> Close your eyes and your nose. He will be like a refiner and a purifier of silver and he will purify. See how he's coming. I'm just describing again, I did this the other week, but I'm describing how God comes to take back that which is supposed to be his. Right? To take back his people, to bring his people unto him. He comes as a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap and he is offensive as that, right? He is offensive and people get offended because he's fiery and he's in a fiery mode. John the Baptist was in a fiery mode. Elijah was in a fiery mode. I've been in fiery modes at times. I'm in one right now, just not as bad as others. But it's not just because of a natural thing. God's in a fiery mode. I've tried to explain this. If we can discern properly, we understand then why the fire of God in the midst of us, why God is moving fiery. It isn't just that John the Baptist thing. It isn't just that apostolic thing. It isn't just that Elijah thing. It isn't just that Terry thing or that Ben thing or that Josiah thing or that Joel thing or whatever thing. <laughs> it can be faked, but the real thing can be discerned too. And the real thing leads us to repentance and leads us to forsake our way, to forsake our sin, to hate evil by loving God first. Right? Is that not true? Anyway, that's the real thing. And I will come to you in judgment and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those 
who oppressed the hired worker. And suddenly, you know, the Lord comes among and he starts dealing with our sin. And sin has been so uh, hidden, so covered over. And we've been soft on sin for so long that we're offended at the Lord dealing with us. The fire of God among us. Now we can say, we all recognize that sin. But what about the sin of self-motivation? What about the sin of leading from self? The sin of wanting self to lead? The sin of demanding that self gets its way right in the house of God? The, de- the sin of carnality? Our minds versus the mind of Christ. Our way versus Christ the way. Our truths versus Christ the truth. Building which, with that which God's not building and is not buildable. Can you hear what I'm saying? Have we even asked the Lord? May the fire of God come among us like never before. That's my prayer. May the God, fire of God get inside of us this time though. And have the right response. Let us humble ourselves before the Lord and become entirely different people. Yes. That's the real effect. Yes. Right? Yes. Someone totally other than what I have become thus far. God's not done working, right? God, give us this vision for himself in this. Let's go on. He will come to you in judgment. It will be the fire of God among us. So let's go on to it. Falsely against those who oppress the hired worker, the widow, the fatherless, and against those who deny justice to the resident alien. They do not fear me, says the Lord of armies. Notice how this keeps coming up. Because I, the Lord, have not changed. And I could add this in there, Joel, and you people won't change. (laughs) <laughs> Why do I think that's so funny? <laughs> I, the Lord, don't change. You po- people won't change. <laughs> what if he said that to us? What if he said that to me? Could I take that? Could I take that kind of straightforward talk by the Lord? I get it all the time. Because I, the Lord, have not changed. But you just... But you, descendants of Jacob, have not been destroyed. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned. See, he's making a distinction here, Joel, between the fathers who were his, right? And these people, these children of the fathers. That's the distinction being made by God. Let me just say it to us real plainly. You want it real plainly? We had an apostle, true apostles back here at the beginning. True. This wasn't based off power displays. It was based off God's call and Christ coming inside of them as the apostle. And they were filled with Christ in this way particularly. The master builder came in to reveal the master plan right in their midst. This is what I want, and here's how you get there, and here's how you don't get there. Right? Is that not true? That's exactly right. Now, God is saying that he wants to turn our hearts back. Right? Is that plain enough? So this book speaks... I would turn your hearts back to the true apostolic, to the apostle Christ in people, the prophet Christ in people, the shepherd Christ in people, right? To the teacher Christ in people. That's what really matters. What should be what makes somebody a teacher is having the teacher inside of them. Now that's not just a, don't misunderstand me, that's not just a salvific thing though. Say, well, he's in me, so I'm a teacher. Well, that's crazy talk. Not all are teachers. You need to read that. No, I'm talking about the Lord himself, not the Spirit of God, just to be distinct. I'm talking about the Lord himself coming in as who he is. Apostle, prophet, right? Preacher or evangelist? Teacher? Shepherd? 
threefold in 1 Corinthians 12, right? First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. I'm talking about that man, the head, coming inside unto headship. Am I clear? Leadership unto headship of Christ. God's trying to turn our hearts back to reality, to what he once had and the early church rejected. Now the question, isn't this right, Joel? The question is, they were offered that back then and they rejected it. Are we going to? Am I making myself clear? I'm trying to. I'm trying to let us see why the Lord of armies is among us and in a fight, right in the gathering. And why he is the Lord of armies? Because there is a fight. And there's been a fight. And there will be a fight if he's to have his full way. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned from my statues. See, there it is again, Joel. Isn't that interesting? The children have turned away from what the fathers were keeping in their devotion to the Lord. That's so key, isn't it, Ryan? What he's trying to explain here by the word of the Lord, what Malachi is offering. You have not kept them. They've not kept the statutes. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? Now, I want us to hear this clearly. A lot of teaching that's gone on with this. I've been unwilling to even teach on this passage because of the amount of misuse concerning this passage. But I want us to maybe, I hope, hear something from the Lord here more in keeping with what God is saying. Okay? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. How have we robbed you, you ask, by not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions? You are suffering under a curse because of this. You and the whole nation are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. He's fighting. What's he fighting for? Now, let me say this. He's not just fighting for the tenth. He's fighting for the support of the leaders of the house of God. That's what he's fighting for. Want me to say it again? He's not fighting for a tithing principle. That principle is under something, right, Ben? That principle is how those who God called to lead were sustained and how the house of God could then function because of the Levites, and thus the priest. So hidden behind all the tithe talk is something extremely important that is a curse. It is a curse to not be concerned about the house of God. It is a curse to not be concerned about the right leadership in the house of God. Don't you think? God's not playing games here. You're not supporting that which I've ordained. My house. And those appointed in my house to serve me. Anyway, is that helpful? Coming out of the background I came out of, all this talk about money just irked the life out of me. That's why I don't want to talk about it because it's been used to manipulate people. But I hope what I just shared with us, and it's the truth of the scriptures here, what I hope what I just shared with us says something to us. In the establishing of God's house, I could go in, right, you can go. We can go into Corinthians and see where this is brought up again. Those who preach the gospel shall live by the gospel. That's no different than saying the Levites were appointed to teach. No different. Right? Is that helpful, guys? Yeah. 
So anyway, here at the end, if we're going to let God restore, if we're going to let God restore, we're going to have to know what we're supporting. Wouldn't you agree? There is that that is of God. And then there's that that is our soulish connections. You agree? I think it's important. Two things are brought out, by the way. I didn't get to it in chapter two. Two things that the people were implicated for. One was right here. The other was their lack of supporting the poor. How many agree that's still important to God? Both of the things. How many agree that the support of the poor and taking care of the poor is helpful? And it's godly, right? And that God speaks directly about it, right? And continues to speak. And how many believe that the house of God being the house of God, though? I'm not calling everything the house of God because God doesn't call everything the house of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's where we don't want to support that. That's not the real. We're going to have to have discernment in the coming days, now in the coming days, to be, how, how does God, let me ask you, does God support that which is not of him? I guarantee you it's people and the devil doing it. <laughs> because it's a deception and Satan wants it. Right? So two things were said here, and you can go back and read it in Malachi. Those two things were their failure to support the poor. It uncovered selfishness. Now, I could get into it. I don't have time to get into all that. What was the poor? People could ask that question. It's a good question. It was God wanting them to take care of those who were truly in need, not in need because they were lazy and wouldn't work, But they were in need because they were working and it wasn't enough or other circumstances play in, health issues, all kinds of stuff, right? God doesn't have a support program for lazy people. He has a word for lazy people, work. <laughs> you like that one, Mark? <laughs> That's just too funny. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's, let's talk about quitting. <laughs> so let's get to uh, the last parts here of uh, Malachi 3 one more time. So uh, Malachi chapter 3. At that time, those who feared the Lord, notice this, spoke to one another. Now that's a good conversation. But the conversation was very uh, precise. It was not general. The conversation was over the condition of the house of God and of the people of God. The condition. The loss of love for God was clear but the lack of the fear of the Lord. What had come to be in the house of God, which was not to be in the house of God, was present. And what the house of God was to be was not present. And it's God who gets to determine that, not man. Leaders are there for God to get what he wants. I said it before, let me say it again. Right? I mean, believe that. Leaders are there. They're, they are, we read it earlier, they are messengers of the Lord of armies. They're what they're meant to be, messengers of the Lord of armies. Their mouth has divine instruction, divine will, divine thought, divine purpose. I keep using the word divine because that's the truth, isn't it, Nancy? We're not talking about man-made doctrines. 
We're not talking about likes and dislikes. We're not talking about that that we are drawn to by our natural whatever minds and thoughts and processes. We're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ and the need of the revelation of Jesus Christ to be established in leaders particularly because they can't lead until that's true, even if they're called. It doesn't matter. And if they're, they won't be commissioned if that's not true because it's not enough to be called to be a leader. You've got to be commissioned. And then you've got to be appointed. And there's years between the call and commission. Years. Years of the beat down, <laughs> right, of self. Clearing the way for the Lord inside of us. Anybody had that going on? Did you recognize it? Or did you squirm and, well, I didn't get my way. No, it was the Lord that was doing those things to you. It was the beat down, it was the beat out. Squirm about it all you want to. The Lord loves you enough and is committed enough to do an inward work and establish himself by getting rid of you and me. <laughs> That's love, right? <clears throat> Define getting rid of. Well, <laughs> another time, okay. <laughs> so anyway, we see it. They're messengers. The messengers should be the leaders. They are messengers of God. He's telling them, here's what I want, and I won't be satisfied unless I have it, and I'm not returning without it. Be made ready. How many realize right now, if we're in the be made ready mode, we have got to pri pri prioritize what's first, foremost, infinitely beyond all other things, and go after it. There's no time to waste. How many agree with me? Let me see your hand because you have no place being here if you don't believe that because you're not going to get anything else. <laughs> it is time to reprioritize in that by the Lord. What does the Lord want? Look at the shortness of the time we have and let him have it in us. Let us become something. And that's through the giving of Christ, the giving of Christ, the giving of Christ, the sharing of Christ. Right? Not just in teaching and preaching, yes, but in the life, in our conversations, in our relationships, the giving of Christ, the giving of Christ. Now, a little bit of lamb don't hurt either. <laughs> I just want you to know that while giving Christ, I'm not against eating while you're doing so. <laughs> Drinking a cup of coffee. I'm not against any of that. I'm for that. just want you to know that. And for anything that strengthens us so that we can give more Christ. <laughs> so yeah, that's my humor. It's terrible, but there it is. <laughs> oh well. Okay, so this is what is said. Here's what the Lord's after in all of this. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one of the other. The Lord took notice and listened. I wonder how much stuff God's really not listening to, not paying attention to that I say. Maybe this message. I don't know if he's listened to any of it. I hope so. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord. Notice there it is again, guys. Right, George? Feared the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs chapter 1. How about Isaiah 33, verse number 6? The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Notice that scripture in lieu of what's about to be said here. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and had high regard for his name. They will be mine. And that's what's said in uh, Numbers chapter 3 concerning the Levites. They're mine. They'll be mine. I take them because of the firstborn that I spared. They become the firstborn to me. They'll be my priests. Isn't that right? Unto God. I take them, they are mine. That's, that's Hebrews chapter three, now, or Numbers chapter three, excuse me, being quoted here in Malachi chapter three uh, concerning a people in Malachi's day. But it's the children being spoken of now, guys. Not the fathers back there in Numbers. It's the children, catch it. Chapter four is about to be fulfilled, Ben. Chapter four is about to become a reality there in Malachi. Those who God said back here shall be mine, where well, there's going to be children going to come into a better relationship even than what they had back there. And that, shouldn't that be true with us? So here it is. 
They will be mine, says the Lord of armies. Notice this again. He's fighting for it. Isn't that beautiful, Keith? God's fighting for this thing. Don't you think, Heidi? Don't you think, Naya, Andy? Don't you think, John David? Don't you think, Esther? That's all the names I can remember right now, so I should have really done <laughs> That was pretty good, though. Got them all right. <laughs> they shall be mine. God's fighting for that. The Lord of armies is fighting for the right thing, the eternal thing. He's on eternal ground before the, so I can say it this way. He's on eternal ground at the golden altar fighting for the right thing. What in the world are we praying about? Right? If ever when there was a time to be with him at the golden altar fighting for what he's fighting for, his full thought, his full will, his full eternal desire and come off the ground of the temporal onto the ground of the, the, the eternal, that time is now. Is that not true? They are mine, says the Lord of armies. He keeps saying this. My own possession for the day I'm preparing. I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son who serves him. My own possession translates in other passages his treasure. Same thing of Isaiah, right? 33 verse six. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Zion's treasure is the fear of the Lord. Want me to say it one more time? God, make it real in me, not as an emotion. Make it real in me in a relationship of love to where I love you first. Revelation chapter two. That I don't leave first love for my self-love or the love of things, or the love of whatever. But instead, love him. To love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. That's the fear of the Lord. That is the fear of the Lord. They will be mine, says the Lord of armies, my own possession on the day I'm preparing, and I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son, and serves him, and you, listen to this, God, isn't this beautiful? So you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, right in the house of God. How many will say with me, should have been that way all the time, be it done unto us according to your word right now. There should be a leadership in the house of God that is distinct from wickedness, distinct from evil, if Christ be in them, if they're really born from above and are in the good of that relationship and it's increasing, there should be a distinction. Is that not right? All the waste was taken outside the city, out the dung gate, it was called. You will again see the difference, the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For look, the day is coming. The Lord of armies has got something to say. I've got something to say from the Lord of armies to us this morning. The day is coming. Right? And many a messenger of the past all the way up to the present with me have said the same thing. They weren't wrong as pertained to the will of God. What was missed was the delay caused by the people of God. But the will of God was missed because of the delay in their time. God, do not let it be in our time. Amen? When all the arrogance, see, here's the fear of the Lord versus arrogance versus pride. When all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root nor branches. But for you who fear my name, there it is again, the son of righteousness will rise with healing 
its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall without hurting yourself. And you will trample. <laughs> Didn't say that, but I, you know, us elderly folks. You will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your kurus <laughs> or your whatever, loafers. <laughs> your feet. Oh, yeah, your feet. That's what it is. <laughs> under your feet on the day that I'm preparing, says the Lord. Remember, remember, he says. Let's see it. The instruction the teaching of Moses, my servant, the statues and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah. You can see this in Luke chapter one when Gabriel's talking to Zacharias about John the Baptist and he's quoting Malachi. You tell me what's about to happen then. Again, Malachi is going to be fulfilled in a final time, in a final way, by a final vessel among a final people, by the Lord of armies, Mike, isn't that the truth? Who's fighting for it. I'm with him in the fight. Josiah talked about it this morning. I'm with him in the fight. You know, he's done it alone before and talks about it, but not this time. Not this time. Those former times must not be this time. Right? So, Lord, we are with you in the fight for the house of God as you purposed it to be. For the people of God as you purposed us to be in Christ and for Christ to be in us. We are with you in the final fight, the final push of the Spirit of God to get a people out completely to you. A people who fear the Lord more than they love themselves. Who are with God more than they are with anyone else. You understand what I'm saying? A people who are his possession. They are a royal priesthood to him. They are a holy nation to him. They are people who will allow him to possess them and become his possession. Make it so now in our time. Give us a leadership. Like what was first raised up back there in the, in the Gospels in the book of Acts. Give us back what you wanted us to always have. Bring back and let us not reject that leadership of God that leads by example, leads by instruction, leads by teaching, leads by the giving of the one who is true food and true drink to the body so that the body may come to health. Health, divine health in divine purpose and divine will and divine thought and divine order in our day, we pray. Give us what you want, Lord, for all the death only is there outside of it. Give us the life that is Christ in our time again. Turn our hearts right now back to the fathers. Turn it back to what you wanted in the beginning and still won't. Turn our hearts fully back and don't let us ever turn away again, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, guys. Yes. As Terry started this morning, I saw clearly we were all in army tents on, an, on a warfare ground. And we were all trembling because we knew the commander of armies was coming to his tent because he's the leader. And I saw him throw back the, the flap of the tent and in his hand was a scroll. And I was very aware that that scroll was a divine blueprint. And it was not only the building of the church, but it was a warfare, a strategy. He was, point, he was unrolling the scroll for you, pointing 
out his instruction for the war and for the building of the body. And it was just burning in me the whole time. And you kept talking about the commander of armies, and I could see him fully armored and huge. He was in fighting mode. Amen. Now to the end, don't you think? Amen. Now to the end, he's going to be in fighting mode. He is, as Omega Man, as he identified this just, uh, I forget, I don't do well with time, it seems, these days. Um, I've got so much time, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> no. Um, a week, maybe, ago, in his appearance, I, I shared it with Donna. Uh, the Omega Man appeared, wanted me to understand, as Omega Man, that he is also the Lord of Armies. Lord of the Saboth. And he's in this time appearing unto the end. I mean unto the final battle. There won't be a battle in the millennium. Fire come out of his mouth and consume them. The final battle is uh, what we would call Armageddon. And he aims to be the one waging war that ends all wars. He said. There's more to it than that, but guys... He has come to fight. And as Josiah said well this morning, and we're saying again, as Nancy said, it's absolutely true. He would spread his banner over us. It is the banner of love, which means fight. Love of God leads us into the battle, right? For God to have his will and way in finality. Lord, we say to you, we are with you to the end. In this fight with you, for you to have all that you want, not part, all of what you eternally want. We bless you in the name of Jesus for it. Amen, guys. Can we blow the show for one more time? I think we should. The shout of war. <clears throat> one thing we can't do is what the Israelites did when Goliath was present. Blow the, the horns of war and not fight. They retreated, ran and hid from Goliath. That can't be us, right? Go ahead. Lord, two words, and we'll shout it, okay? Two words, we fight, all right? One, two, three, we, we fight. fight! Amen. Amen. So be it, Lord.